So hello everyone, Adrienne here, and I do have a very special guest on my channel. This is my dear friend Adam of The Black Rose. I'm very pleased to have him here, and we're going to be discussing the weird bias against um, operatic singing in goth music, as well as this really weird resistance to acknowledge uh, gothic literature as part of the subculture. So how are you today? I am well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I think it's important to express my gratitude to you. I'm really excited. I am a bit frustrated because these are very, very frustrating subjects. They are. And, you know, um, especially with the first one about the elitism or anti-operatic goth music or anti-ethereal, whatever, I'm quite frustrated because I always been blind to it it's actually you who brought it to my awareness and after looking more into it on youtube and a little bit on instagram i've noticed yes that there are some people that are absolutely against it and they happen to be really young people <laughs> they think they yeah. are more than everybody else and it's got that try hard energy just trying to fit in kind of thing Right, um, trying to appear as goth as humanly possible. Therefore, anything yeah. that could possibly taint their precious little bubble of like 80s trad goth is exactly. not accepted in yes. their eyes yes. as like relevant to the subculture. It's ridiculous. It's very ridiculous. And with your help, I'm here to blow it to smithereens. <laughs> Good. So sorry about that uh, technical difficulty. As I was saying... I technically do fall under that trad golf label, whatever it is. Uh, not that sticker that I proudly wear on my head. Um, yeah, my favourite side of golf is the 80s and 90s gothic rock and post-punk. Um, of course, I love Susie and the Banshees, The Cure, Bauhaus, etc. And for those that are wondering, I also really love bands like Exmoor Deutschland, um, Spetsman, Pink Tones Blue, Echo and the Bunnymen. Nosferatu, Age of Heaven, Incubus Succubus, uh, Two Witches, Corpus Delecti, um, The Merry Thoughts, uh, The Wake, of course, and, uh, you know, um, bands like that going right through uh, Garden of Delight and Angels of Liberty. However, I do not believe that I am a, an acceptable golf because that's a side that I lean on. Absolutely not. Golf has many, many different sides. Well, okay, not many, many, but let's say five to six. And I do wish to give an example. Let's look at three other subcultures, uh, the industrialists, the metalheads, and the punks. And I have been in more than one subculture throughout my life, so I do know what I'm talking about. I've been in the underground Good. since 2005. <laughs> that helps. And <laughs> yes. So let's look at the industrialists, our, our neighbours, as we call them sometimes. They've got... Um, the rivet head side, so those are people who typically listen to what we know as post-industrial. So that would be electro-industrial and industrial rock. Think uh, front to forge, front line assembly, skinny puppy, old ministry, old nine inch nails. You get the idea. Then you've got the cyber golf side, who are people who listen to uh, more agrotech. So let's look at bands like Hoseco, God Module, Tactical, or sorry, Tactical Sect, <laughs> I said that wrong. And, you know, Centron and bands like that. And they dress differently. Both are industrialists. Both are under the same umbrella. And they're both a different side. Same goes with punks. Think of, for example, those into hardcore, how they dress and how hardcore punk sounds compared to ska and how fans of ska dress. Uh, let's look at metalheads. They've got the same kind of idea. Let's look at thrash metal. That sounds one way, and thrashers have a certain way of dressing. Uh, now let's look at the symphonic metal side. That sounds quite different. And those fans, as well as bands, have another way of dressing. Both are metalheads. But just it's all metal. Different. Exactly. So if that's the case with the other subcultures, I would like to scold those people by asking, why is goth any different? Right. Why is God not allowed to be different? Why can't we have the death rockers, the trad goths, the romantic goths, and even going into the subgenres, ethereal wave, dark wave, death rock, gothic rock, and post punk, and cold wave, the French cold wave stuff? Why are we not allowed that? Why does a person have to be only trad to be considered goth? 
Right. And they seem to like linger in like the, the trad post punk mm-hmm. and like death rock, like cluster mm-hmm. of the different like goth subgenres, so to speak, it, like both in terms of style and in terms of the musical offshoot of yes. those subgenres. So it's really interesting yes. that they cling to this like one yes. little bubble, or this one mm-hmm. little cluster and say anything that does not fall within this bubble is not really goth. And it's just like, bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bro. <laughs> exactly. I could think of one YouTuber who made a video about those people. They pointed out the age group that all of them happen to be really young. And as I was saying earlier, it's got that try hard energy. Right. And usually people like that end up growing out of the subculture. At least I hope that's the case because we don't need this rubbish elitism around. <laughs> uh, you, <agree>. know. <laughs> you know, because first of all, we've already dealt with other kinds of elitism that bled into the subculture from other subcultures. <coughs> the metal one, <coughs> <laughs> you know, with things relating to skin color and sexism and all of that ghastly nonsense. Now oh, we've yeah. got this. We don't need that. Golf came out of punk. It's a very, very highly left-leaning scene. So, you know, we have a hard time already with the race and that stuff as it is. Now we've got only trad golf is real golf. Whoever came up with this rubbish, it's frustrating. It, it really is. is. Yes. And another thing too, and uh, we talked about this a little bit um, before yeah. we started this. Uh, this broadcast is that we um, talked about how by com- like totally embracing the weird, like a uh, post-punk uh, trad goth and death rock kind of cluster. It kind of disregards the weird, the natural progression that goth took in the 1990s where things yeah. beca- became more romantic, more ethereal. Um, yes. There was a lot more inspiration from like neo-Victorian fashion. And that was yeah. just kind of following the mainstream trend just in general. Right. Well, and as I have it written down to add that that's what the whole uh, new German death art movement was all about. You go mm-hmm. back to bands like Support Eternus and the Ensemble of Shadows. Uh, Blood and Ashes, I don't know how to say their Latin name, Sanguis et Sinus, I'm not familiar with how to say it. Um, old Lacrimosa. Uh, yes, even, Old Lacrimosa. Yeah, uh, even Das Ich came out of that movement. So, And that's what it was all about. And those Goths have their own style. And if you go back to the old pictures of Wave Gothic Treffen from the early 90s, you will see them. They look exactly like Anna Varney Count Dea. And they're especially known for that chain that connects between the ear and the nose. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, the very unique. About. Yes, exactly. It's very special to that movement. So, you know, and I also have written down to talk about some examples of different operatic and ethereal um, goth. Uh, subgenres and bands and stuff like that. But first, I do want to tell your viewers um, a small astrology report that I think is fascinating because it's so applicable to this conversation. Um, now, I do come from a Commonwealth country, Canada, but I do not care about the weather. In Commonwealth countries, I don't know what is it people are so obsessed with the weather. Every half an hour, <laughs> they have to talk about the weather. <laughs> it's a very British thing and it definitely bled into Canadian culture. I am not like that. I am more fascinated with the astrology. So what's past the clouds? So outside the earth, that's what fascinates me more. (laughs) And (laughs) yes, so I was watching the astrology report about today, Tuesday, October the uh, 26th, 2021. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one aspect is we've got the moon in Cancer and we've got an opposition happening. We've got Chiron, which is an asteroid Uh, located uh, past uh, Pluto Charon, uh, and that's opposing Mercury and Libra. So opposition in astrology means six houses apart. That usually creates conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, Libra is an air sign, so it's all about logic, and especially Libra, it's about balance, rules, diplomacy, regulations, common sense, and all those things. So when Mercury goes into that sign, the planet of communication, it's about logical things um, ought to be communicated. Yes. Um, whereas when you've got Chiron, which is the, um, in astrology, it's a planet, even though it's an asteroid, uh, which is all about the internal struggles, your deepest struggles you've ever had. That one's located in Aries. Aries rules the ego and the head. In astrology, it's a very 
a stubborn, egotistical kind of sign. Doesn't mean that it's negative. Aries has lots of qualities. But when you get Chiron going into that and opposing Libra, that creates conflict. We've got our side that's trying to talk some common sense into those people, whereas their side that's opposing us is all their ego, the massive ego. And I do mm -hmm. want to make a reference to a Gothic novel, The Castle of Toronto. It's one of my favorites. It's um, in the story, there's a giant helmet that falls and kills somebody. Yes. And, and that uh, giant helmet is supposed to be a metaphor for the king's ego. So that's the kind of energy we're working with. <laughs> now, now, on the other side of the chart, there's another aspect happening between Venus and Neptune. But the point is, the astrologer said, when we've got these aspects happening in three different sides of the chart, which looks a little bit like a letter T, but not quite, <laughs> uh, it feels like things are going in circles and you start to feel you're like between a rock and a hard place. That made me laugh because, first of all, that's um, a song by Sisters of Mercy on <laughs> always. So that made me laugh. Of course. And secondly, uh, bloody hell, that's exactly what you and I are dealing with. We're between a rock and a hard place. We've got one side that are bloody elitists. They think, oh, trad golf only or not golf at all. And then we've got the other side. They don't want the music. They don't want the literature. They don't want, you know, anything. All they want is white skin, a small body, preferably a girl's body to pose like this, pose like that, listen to some really crazy music, do some self-mutilation perhaps. Yeah. Um, and that's what makes you goth. And people like you and I, when we try to talk to them, we get called elitists. I got called a narcissist on multiple occasions. I've also been called, what's that other word? Um, oh, what's that bloody word now they're using all the time? Uh, gaslighting. I've been told that I'm gaslighting people when I tell them that you can't be off if you don't listen to goth music. Mm. So we are between a rock and a hard place and how interesting we're having this conversation today. <laughs> absolutely. It yeah. makes absolute sense. I guess it just, yeah. uh, it was in the stars for this conversation to happen today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was totally meant to be. And I really like what you and I were talking about earlier before we got into this call. What I was saying, I because I come from a Turkish background predominantly, so I really like the idea of the Turk and the Latina um, I mean, you know, scum people like that to smithereens because that's what they deserve. They deserve to be yes. blown to smithereens. If they're not going to at least listen to what we have to say, well, they deserve to be blown to smithereens. Or <laughs> we say in Turkish. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yes. And I like I... to call those people pendejos. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? So, um, it's a very, very derogatory word in Spanish that means stupid. Okay. Like, it, okay. it's, not, yeah. it's not like, um, oh, you idiot. It's more like, oh, you fucking idiot. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we would call people like that ishek, which translates to donkey or ass. So <laughs> that's what they are. They're, you know, donkeys. And I have a small list of bands that are either operatic or at least in that realm but before i get a to little that, in, a little adjacent yeah yes but before i want to get into that i mean we talked about the new german death art a little bit but i want to get into that a bit slowly and i want to remind some of those trad golf only people <laughs> of some golf classics now i don't know if switchblade symphony falls into that category because they're more dark wave but I do want to talk about the concept of the band because I don't know of any proper golf that negates Switchblade Symphony. I mean, I know they went trip hop a little bit the last two albums. I'm going to be talking about one of them. It's got a song called Soldiers. Yes. Now, you know, I don't, I don't know if you remember that song. There's this part where she sings, oh, I'm not yep. mimicking it properly, so I'm sorry about that. But I, but I know you, you know the song I'm talking about. That's very yes. semi operatic. Ooh. That, that part, yeah. perfect, perfect. You got it. That's very semi-operatic, and very. that that's the whole point of the band. That's why they're called Switchblade Symphony because they're com symphony. combining the um, the kind of industrial elements along with like symphonic and, in this case, kind of operatic elements. It's awesome, and that's one of the things I love about Switchblade Symphony. Yes. They really embody that time in the '90s where me too they were making that yes. transition to the more romantic and the 
orchestral and the symphonic elements. It's just awesome. <laughs> yes. And I now going back into the 80s, I want to talk about the song Beatrix by Cocteau Twins. The the opening part, I don't remember the lyrics, but it goes something like this. Oh, 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 oh. It's also very semi-operatic. It's on um Treasure, that album. Mm -hmm. It's very semi-operatic. You can, I mean it, they're not really an operatic band at all, actually. They're definitely not what I would call neoclassical. It's straightforward ethereal wave, but it's leaning in that direction of that singing style. Now, to those beloved track goth only elitists, I want to take them back to this corrosion by the Sisters of Mercy. How did that song start off? Bravo. Oh! I'm not, not saying that I'm mimicking it correctly, but right. Uh, how did that start off? To me, that's very choir music. It's very choir music, absolutely. It's very, yes. um, it sounds very much like a chorus in like an opera company to me. Yes, absolutely. It's definitely in the operatic. Right, absolutely. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you're the opera singer, so I have to check with you. <laughs> of course, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, and um, always check with the pro. And so that's why now I want to go, you know, first of all, sorry, I'm a bit scattered, so many thoughts. No, you're fine. My head. I, I really like thank how this you. is going. Perfect. Thank you. Before going into um, uh, th that list of that short list of bands I've got, um, I understand people's fear and where it's coming from. In the 2000s, during my time, uh, symphonic metal was huge. You know, yes. You know, bands like uh, Nightwish, Epica, uh, Within Temptation. I get it. That stuff was really huge in the two thousands, and it still kind of is. I get it. And since then, it's always been placed in the goth category, and that's why so many people run away from anything uh, resem that resembles that. I get it. But first of all, relax. That's what I <laughs> tell those people. Take a deep breath and relax. It's that that music first of all, sounds very different from the bands I'm going to mention. Because, you know, when we go into the realm of ethereal wave, neoclassical dark wave, it doesn't sound like that. It's, it doesn't have those crazy shredding guitars. Mm -mm. The style of singing is a bit different. Even though it's operatic, it's still a little bit different. And of course, there are the added electronics. It does not sound the same. It does not take one style of singing to change the entire subgenre of a band. It really doesn't. Exactly. So one band I want to take all of us to, and I know you like them as well, is Requiem in White. Oh, I love them. Yes, they are amazing. I especially want to mention the song Call Before Me. I think that was on, um, what was that album called? The it, something to do with a want. It has the picture of the woman. It's their debut album, I believe. Unfortunately, it's escaping me at the moment. <laughs> yeah, something to do with infinite want. But I'm sure fans know the one I'm talking about. Uh, you know, there was that operatic um, style of singing introduced over the gothic rock um, music. And I'm willing to bet, I could be wrong, but I'm willing to bet that they took that influence from Sisters of Mercy after hearing this corrosion. I would not be surprised. I would definitely agree. And I also think that they may have been uh, taking a few cues as well from uh, Diamanda Galas, who is also an operatically trained singer. Uh, yes. I and um, yes. I love her too. She's amazing. Yes. And <laughs> how um, it it is like, she is accepted among certain circles of elder goths yeah. that I um, interact with as yes. within the goth um, subculture within the goth yes. umbrella of music mm -hmm. but of course the nitpickers are just like oh no it's not real goth and just shut up just shut up already <laughs> we could at least call it golf adjacent and i'm going to now um transition or segue into another band that is loved by many golfs including myself deform yes deform is I definitely featuring operatic vocals a lot. And I want to talk just a little bit about their history. They came out of the French cold wave movement. So I know they border more on industrial, especially the last two to three albums. Their 2010s mm -hmm. work is far more electro industrial. Even their operatic elements have toned down a lot. But going back to the 2000s and the 20th century, and even after they transitioned out of cold wave and dark wave and started exploring electro industrial, 
they have kept a lot of those neoclassical operatic goth elements. And, and that's if, one of the things I love about them so much. Uh, yes, me too. Uh, and they do it so well. Also, you might notice amongst the industrial um, fan base, they're not very popular. They're really not. They're more it's popular weird. with goths. Well, to me, it actually makes a lot of sense because, yes, there is a lot of electro-industrial, but again, those dark wave elements, those neoclassical elements, they're there. They're really there. And I think that's what many goths are attracted to. And I want to talk about some new school bands that I really like. One of them is called Manticore Kiss. They're from my city here in Vancouver. Lovely. And they've got, yes, they've got one song out called Abuli. I mean, they've got their EP. It's called uh, Intertwined. Beautiful EP. It's only available on Bandcamp. It's only a digital release. So I have it. And uh, Kat, the, um, one of the vocalists or the main vocalist, uh, that she has, she's classically trained. She has those operatic elements. And I actually got to meet her at a concert once. And I, and I talked to her and I said, you know what? You remind me so much of Requiem in White. Just taking those dark wave elements, adding the operatic singing. It, and she does it so beautifully. And they've got some synth elements, some dark wave elements, a cello. You know, her partner Ari plays the cello. So... You know, that's a very new school band. And another one that's about the same age is uh, The Palace of Tears. And I know you know of them. Yes. Oh, my God. That band is breathtaking. I, I absolutely agree. Of enough words to describe them. They are amazing, breathtaking, stellar. They're, you know, whenever I listen to them, I imagine just, you know, a whole flock of bats uh, at a castle or a golf soiree or somewhere really lavish like that. And they're singing to all of us, you know, especially <laughs> those songs they've got, like um, uh, the one about the womb. Uh, uh, I'm more of an album person, so I remember the album uh, right. more than the song titles. So the titles, uh, Tears of the Moon, that's one I've got written down. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they've only got that one album out of Ruination. And oh my God, that band, it, it's, you know, Beautiful. And again, going back to the symphonic metal problem, it doesn't sound like that at all. It doesn't have those crazy guitars. She's not over singing it. It's not aggressive. It's not aggressive at all. And you can hear the dark wave. You can hear it. Lycia. Uh, you know, I was invited to do a guest review over at Obscure and Dead for this album a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly how I described the Palace of Tears. I said they sound like Lycia meets Deform. It's it's goth. It's very goth. It's very goth. Absolutely. And yeah. again, it blows my mind how some people are so quick to discount or discredit or uh, delegitimize any kind of mm -hmm. anything that even vaguely resembles kind of operatic singing. And I'm just like, first of all, dude, get over yourself. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and take the Peter Murphy uh, blow up doll out of your ass. I'm sure you're tired of walking around with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best thing i can i can like yeah. compare their attitude to because yeah. that must just be the way they think sometimes you know <laughs> well again go back to the astrology thing it's all about the ego or the giant helmet like in castle for toronto mm -hmm. it's all about that bloody ego that try hard energy to think oh the more traditional i will be the more goth i will appear uh, the metal subculture, which I unfortunately was part of for a while, mm -hmm. uh, they go through the same thing. If they listen to only death metal and black metal, but they negate symphonic metal, then they look more metalhead. Whereas if they listen to the symphonic side of it, they're more of a poser. Right. And, you know, and punks I've heard have that same thing with ska. Some of them don't really like the ska stuff too much. <laughs> they like the anarcho punk the uh, hardcore punk you know the more aggressive side of it otherwise that other stuff is a little bit too i don't know wavy flag better word and so i don't understand what is it with all those subcultures including our own that's got these issues that you have to stick to one side of it otherwise you're only adjacent or not even part of it at all and i don't get it i mean you worded it perfectly get that peter murphy blood doll uh, out of your ass because it's not helpful it's not helpful at all <laughs> yeah seriously yeah. they just give off that vibe 
And yeah. um, like I said, when I was younger and I was first getting in like seriously into the goth communities um, online, they were uh, telling me that I was betraying the subculture for uh, singing in operatic style instead of learning to sing in post-punk style because you know, that was a betrayal of the subculture and I should be preserving the subculture. And that didn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. Just like, what? Well, Where how can we get that? Well, out of the arts, is like you said, and why do they not say that to the singers of Requiem in White? Why do they not say that to Andrew Eldridge when he decided to have that choir in uh, this mm-hmm. erosion? Is, is that not betrayal then? Yeah, according to that stupid, uh, according logic. to that stupid logic and argument or lack thereof. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I was so eager to do this video with you, because, like I said, you know, the post punk stuff is what got me into goth. My gateway was the Cure way back in two thousand five. I never thought of myself as goth until two thousand eighteen. So there's been quite a you know a bridge between two thousand five and two thousand eighteen, but that's how it started for me. First it was the Cure, then it was Susie and the Banshees and Bauhaus around the same time and then the Sisters of Mercy I fell in love with all of them and you know then my journey continued later on I discovered Rosetta Stone, Fields of the Nephilim and all those weapons that I mentioned earlier I fell in love with all of them and sure it's my favourite side but I do not love the ethereal or operatic side any less. I mean, I just talked about the Palace of Tears. I talked about Manticore Kiss, Requiem in White, even Faith in the Muse. They fall yes. a little bit in that category. And if you listen to Cantus, for example. Oh God, I sounds, love Cantus. It's great. Yeah. It sounds very neoclassical dark wave. You know, it sounds very much like the kind of music that Dead Can Dance makes, or used to make at least. So what is it with this kind of elitism and try hard energy? I don't know what it is, but I'm not an elder goth, but I am 29. So Mm -hmm. my advice to people like that, if you want to call it advice, is stop because (laughs) you're not doing yourself a favor. You're not doing subculture a favor. And actually you're not any less discriminating than those bigots who say, to be goth, you have to have a certain skin color, a certain gender, or a certain body type. You're mm-hmm. in the same um, boat, or as I like to say, the same fruit, different pile. Yes. It's, you know, it's unacceptable because every genre, just like I said, with punk and metal and industrial, um, even the Billy stuff, when you go into the rock Billy and psych Billy, etc., every subculture has multiple sides. Even emos, if you remember the 2000s emo, yes. some of them leaned a bit towards what we know as metal core. So bands like Bullet for My Valentine and that kind of sound. And some of them leaned more towards the pop punk side of it, like My Chemical Romance, The Used, etc. So mm-hmm. even in that scene, they've had different sides. There's always been that diversity and variety. So And let's be real, if... If we clung to that cluster of death rock, trad goth, and yeah. post punk, it would get boring yeah. very, very quickly. Absolutely. It would get boring. It wouldn't grow. Even the modern post punk, which to me sounds way more dark wave. So bands like She Passed Away, Hat Packs, um, Ash Code, Lebanon Hanover, and uh, Twin Tribes, you know, those bands, they sound so fresh. And that's why so many of us love them. You mm-hmm. know, they sound very, very fresh. Even Rose Garden Funeral Party. I mean, they remind me a bit of the cult, a little bit, which I really like. Yeah, a little bit. So, yeah, so, you know, diversity is key. Why not? So I, w- what I would like to see happen is this form of elitism and any form of elitism dismissed. It doesn't belong. I absolutely agree. Because... Whether they realize this or not, but they're also scaring people away from the subculture yeah. as if to kind of create their own little exclusive clique and feel super important yeah. and, you know, stuff like that. It really doesn't make any sense to me. And so yeah. when I talk to the elder goths that I'm friends with and they yeah. say, oh, yeah, you know, I love Requiem and White. I love Switchblade Symphony. I yeah. love uh, DA Form mm-hmm. and all these other bands that feature... Um, semi-operatic or operatic vocals when I hear the elder goths say that it 
it makes me feel a little bit more validated in gravitating toward those kinds of uh, subgenres more than like the post-punk ones. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, trad golf, death rocker, uh, romantic golf, whatever, I personally think these are more terms to describe the clothes that mm -hmm. we wear. So for example, if you look at my makeup today, it's not quite trad, not quite death rock, just kind of in the middle of that whole thing. Yeah. So I use it, whereas yours seems more romantic. So we can use those terms like that, but to put it as a sticker on your forehead and say, you know, only trad golf is real, that's absolute rubbish. And it especially frustrates me when it comes from people that are only 18, 20, like those uh, tweens that we're seeing on Instagram and places. And like even that. people that are in their yeah. like 30s or like their late 20s that pull that crap is just like, yeah. um, who are you doing this for? I'd really like to know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It doesn't um, make sense at all. I do have one friend, a really dear friend of mine, actually. They do not really like the operatic stuff, not because they feel it doesn't belong in golf. It's that death rock is their favorite. That's what draws them to the scene. That's what right. They and love there's the most. there's nothing wrong with that. And Absolutely not. the same goes for the other yeah. for the person on the other end of the spectrum that prefers the more ethereal and operatic elements. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And to me, I think I mean whoever is is watching this and is more uh, similar minded to yourself and is really into the operatic side of the genre you belong. The issue that I have, that a lot of goths have, and maybe yourself, I don't know, is when people obviously value the clothes more than the music. Absolutely. And so to attach themselves um, with a very thin string or a thin, what's that word? Thread, a very thin thread to the scene, they decide to prance around bands like Blood Angel and there's really adjacent bands, even leaning on the agrotech stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and the word goth is so integral to their identity <laughs> that if you say you're not goth, they slap your corpse face. Pretty much. My issue, yeah, my issue is with those people because first of all, if you like the music that much, or the, or the sub, sorry, if you like the subculture that much, that means you like the music. So if all you're doing is pulling just these two or three adjacent bands like Blood Angel or you know whoever they might be. And, you know, you're just prancing your way around those bands while listening to a lot of industrial, a lot of grunge, a lot of metal, etc. Well, you're not goth. You're not goth at all. But somebody who loves the more ethereal, operatic side of the genre, they, so people like you, you belong. You absolutely belong. And also, we um, complete each other. Like I said, it's when you, you go to a goth night or a goth concert, something that all of us are missing right now, you yes. see you see the different types of goths, you know, you just, and you can tell it, you know, by their, for example, if they're wearing a band t-shirt and then say they've got a death hawk and it's got Christian death, you can say, oh, that's a death rocker. Or if they look more like myself, oh, that's definitely a trad goth. Or if they look more like you, that's more a, a romantic goth for sure. You know, we complete each other. It creates variety. It creates beauty. And, yes. And my, another one of my questions to scumbags like that is, who are you to take that away from us and from the scene? Yeah. Who do you think you are that you can dictate what other people listen to and or wear? That doesn't make any exactly. sense. And another thing, this has been said before, to be golf, it does mean you only have to like golf music. If you want to listen to other genres, that's totally fine. I listen to a lot of genres. I can't even write a list, you know, <laughs> from golf to industrial to metal to pop music, a lot of, you know, um, European and Mediterranean folk pop, because that's a lot of my background. I love it. You know, I I love a lot of Turkish music. I love a lot of Lebanese music. I also like some neighboring pop music from neighboring countries like Greece and Serbia and Bulgaria and those countries, because, you know, it kind of takes back to my roots a little bit. And I love it. I love it very, very much. I also like some songs by Cher. I've seen Cher back in 2014. She's oh, wow. a phenomenal singer live. Um, I also like a little bit of Celine Dion, you know, her voice is also really beautiful. So is that of Sarah Brightman. You see, I, and when Lady Gaga was famous 10 years ago, 
I did enjoy some of her songs, but mind you, she did get old quickly in my mind, but <laughs> never music didn't last with me. But, it, you know, I enjoy a variety of things. Golf happens to be my favourite, and that's totally acceptable. So when you limit yourself to tried golf music, you know, you're and you're, you know, eliminating everything from your life, you're just turning yourself into a little mindless mouse, and that's not helpful. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Take me for instance, you know, um, I often like to tell my husband this and he just kind of yeah. rolls his eyes at me because he doesn't like Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. But um, oh, yes. Queen was my gateway drug to opera. And, uh -huh. you know, when I was a kid he hearing that for the first time, I was just like, wow, that is just so cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then I like, you know, I, I love Queen. Um, yeah. obviously I, I love opera because I'm an opera singer and I kind of have yes. to listen to that genre in order to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Otherwise yes. I do like symphonic metal as well. I like a I lot of industrial. Like um, yeah. I like a tiny itty bitty bit of punk music or pop music. I should say pop. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's okay to like multiple genres and it doesn't, like liking the other genres doesn't invalidate you from being a, a goth and yeah. it doesn't turn you into a poser. <laughs> no, it does not turn you into a poser. Not at all. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I do want to open up to you a little bit about my very, 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 very small opera background. I'm obviously not an opera singer, nor am I an aficionado or an expert in it, but I did study it a little bit in elementary school and I really loved it. Uh, my music teacher was an opera singer nice. with this company called Vancouver Opera. They're the major opera company here in Vancouver. They host the shows and plays and all those things. She had a, oh, a magnificent voice. We used to hear it all the way from the playground whenever she would sing. And I remember one play or opera that we learned about was La Boheme, Maybe you know that one. I do. Um, yes. Puccini is my voice teacher's favorite composer. Yeah. And we learned about Johann Sebastian Bach or Bach. How, how do you say it? Bach? Bach. Bach. The vowel. Bach. Thank you. Yeah, the, the vowel. That's okay. We learned about, yeah, we learned about Beethoven. As you can tell, it's been so many years since I've last learned it. We learned about Mozart, of course, and Requiem and all of that. We learned all that stuff and... I love all those things and I loved it. I loved it very much. And I also listened, I'm not sure if you remember that Italian group called, uh, sorry, I'm not saying it right, I L space Volo. Il Volo? Il Volo, yeah. Yeah, the, the three men. They were quite famous in the 2010s. I remember I had one of their CDs and I used to listen to it sometimes. It's, I see a lot of beauty in opera. And if that, wants to make its way into golf which it already has over 30 years ago i'm more than open to that i love it i'm a fan of some of those bands well and i definitely want to contribute to its revival yes. um because i obviously love goth music i obviously love opera and it seems yeah. only fair to uh combine the two i'm actually in the process of writing a song at the moment yes. um shocker it's about absinthe <laughs> <laughs> lovely <laughs> um but i'm writing a song about absinthe and it's going to yeah. be crossing um the genres of uh like dark wave and the and the ethereal genres as well as classical and operatic music so i look forward to uh not only like contributing to the genre but also kind of uh showing people hey this is a thing that can happen. Get over it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And when it comes out, if you decide to sell it, for example, on Bandcamp or if you have physical copies, I will be buying it. Okay, good. <laughs> I, love, I love that kind of music. And I think everyone should because it belongs in goth. And yes. yeah. So going back to this rock in the hard place. So I think we've blown the rock to smithereens. Now we've got the hard place. Those who think that goth music is irrelevant and not only that now they think gothic literature is irrelevant and that brings steam out of my head <laughs> i mean yes i do agree that the literature is not an asset to being goth it's the music no definitely and, not and i also understand that it's influenced other bands because i've also had some people from the metal subculture 
rebots hold with me when I talk about the significance of Gothic literature on the golf uh, or in the golf subculture. They rebut all, you know, nonsense things like, well, other bands have done a do too. Some obscure uh, doom metal band is completely devoted to Edgar Allan Poe. And they and also bands like uh, Theatre of Tragedy and Theatre of Vampires, all of them great bands. Okay, fine. I've got no problem with that. I'm happy they did all of that. But what I'm talking about is very specific. It's like that saying, uh, punks listen to punk, goths listen to goth, metalheads listen to metal and the music is not going anywhere. I'm going back to that concept. Without Gothic literature and Gothic film, goth music wouldn't have existed. At least in the way that we recognize it now. Exactly. And uh, I remember reading about uh, Peter Murphy way back in the 70s when they were doing um, the Bella Session. Mm -hmm. uh, he binge watched many Gothic and horror films and that was part of the inspiration of you know creating that all the ghosts he's dead etc mm -hmm. and so it was the case with uh Susie sue even the damned uh, how trad of me i love the damned i really 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 do oddly enough that's one of those trad bands that yeah. i really really like yeah i uh strawberries uh the black album the phantasmagoria uh, oh i just i love that stuff so much and you know they were inspired by that stuff as well so uh, you know, and I've got a whole list of songs. I won't go into all of them individually, but it is a, a short list. I will quickly go through them. Right. I have a few of my own as well. Perfect. Uh, let's see if you have any common ones. Okay. Uh, we've got, um, what's that one called? Okay, so Sepoy, Turnus, and the Ensemble of Shadows. The uh, Conqueror Worm. That one is um, an Edgar Allan Poe poem. And yes. She was However, um, I wasn't sure if you had heard of her release, uh, Poetica, All Beauty yes. Sleeps. Yeah. That entire I, album, that album is dedicated that, to Poe. That entire album is dedicated yeah. to Poe. Perfect. Yes. I did talk about that uh, album briefly in an Instagram video not long ago. Uh, right. going, back, going back to The Damned with the Black Album, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's an example. Uh, Nosferatu with Lucine is Red. That's the, you know, the 1990 Dracula. Yes. Um, the Kentucky Vampires had a song called uh, Daughter of the Morning Star. And it's got snippets from the movie uh, Mark of the Vampire. Um, yeah, that's the new school one. Uh, oh, one of my favorites, um, Heathcliff by Diva Destruction. Oh, yes. I had that one too on my list. Yeah, I love Heathcliff. I'm really obsessed with Heathcliff. Um, Through the Pale Door by Faith in the Muse. Mm -hmm. I uh, go absolutely nuts for that song. Yeah, you know that whole album, Evidence of Heaven, is amazing. Yes. I love, I love everything by Faith and Muse, but that album's my favorite. Same um, here. That is my favorite album that they it's have created. An amazing album. Yeah, it's a beautiful one. Uh, uh, Witching Hour by uh, sorry, uh, Lygia by Witching Hour. I know you're familiar with that one. <laughs> of course. Yeah, uh, Bell Lugosi's He's Dead by Bauhaus, that one's famous. Uh, I'm Her Frankenstein by Alien Sex Fiend. There are also um, not songs inspired by gothic literature, but horror stuff, spooky things that are more adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. There's Moonchild by Fields of the Nephilim and High Empress by Garden of Delight. Those are based on Crowley stuff, Alistair mm -hmm. Crowley. Uh, the Cure has Killing an Arab, which is... Uh, it comes from the novel The Stranger, which is originally a French book. I don't know how to say it in French, uh, but in English it's The Stranger. Uh, we've got Cinema Strange. They, uh, they've got Mound Shroud, which is from the book The Halloween Tree. Uh, going back to the damned, they've got Grimly Fiendish. Uh, that's about um, a comic book character from the 1960s. Uh, there is, oh, he was called Grimly Fiendish. And there's also one of my very ultimate favorites, Sideshow by The Wake. That one's about the uh, cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Uh, sorry if I didn't pronounce the Italian name correctly. Uh, Caligari, I think. Okay, yeah. And also, I want to mention, speaking of uh, Cinema Strange, they've got another song, I forgot what it's called, but it's about Edgar Allan Poe. And along with uh, Through the Pale Door by Faith and Muse and a song by Community FK, uh, it's on a compilation called Songs of Terror, uh, a gothic tribute to Edgar Allan Poe. The I actually devoted an entire video to that album. 
Oh, really? I oh, did. I have to go watch it. And that uh, album or compilation is was released in 2021. I'm sure some copies are still around, but the whole compilation is available on YouTube. People can listen to it. I think it was released back in the 90s, and then it's been re-released a couple of times since then. Oh, quite possibly. Highly, highly possibly. Yeah, what I did in that video is um, I took snippets from those songs... And I played them along with with displaying the original text from the source material that it is inspired by, like a little snippet from the story or the poem that it's inspired by, along with a piece of artwork that is associated with that story. Interesting. I want to go and watch that video eventually. I will send it to you after we're done here because I am really proud of that video. That was a lot of work. I Um, bet. It was so much work, but it was totally worth it. Yeah. What I really wanted to do was kind of evoke that emotional connection between the original text by Edgar Allan Poe with yeah. the goth music that w- it was inspired by. Yes. Or and that's the other amazing. way around. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I understand. Yeah, that's totally amazing. And it's interesting you mentioned art because uh, here, let me see if I can minimize the screen. I should have wrote it down. Uh yeah, so there are three, um, well, an album, a single, and a compilation that I want to talk about. I'm sure everyone's familiar with Corpus Delecti. Yes. Their album, Sylphs, uh, which is my favourite by them. It's got that picture, which is called uh, The Wood of the Self-Murderers by William Blake, who is also a poet. And it's based on uh, a story or, or a play, I can't remember. It's called The Divine Comedy by, uh, sorry about the Latin, Dante Alighieri. <laughs> I'll let you have uh, Dante Ale- Alighieri. Yes, um, the you, Divine Comedy. Um, yes. That's actually one of my husband's favorite books. Mm-hmm. Um, he especially. The actually, it was older than that. Yeah. Oh. Older. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, much older. Um, yeah. I think it was like the 14th or 15th century, mm-hmm. but. Um, but yeah, so uh, the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, um, yeah. wonderful piece of work. And a lot could argue that it is a, a precursor to a lot of Gothic literature. Oh, or... so is Beauty and the Beast. Yes. A lot of precursors, even Macbeth by Shakespeare. Absolutely. Lots of precursors yeah. that kind of set up the stage for Gothic literature to exist. Um, yes. On my list, oh God, I have, I have a lot on my list, but I'm just going to name a yeah. few. Uh, sure. Before you do that, I'm just going to quickly name those two other pictures that I was talking oh, about. Oh, yes. One is on Vampires, Witches, Devils and Ghouls, the best of Nosferatu, their 2006 compilation. That picture has two titles. Some call it The Sleeping Venus and some call it Venus Asleep. And it's by Paul Dielvaux. Sorry, I'm butchering the French. And Bauhaus used that same picture for their single uh, dark entries back in the 80s mm-hmm. and also the cover of the Bella Sessions of 1979 has a, a picture of or I should say a picture of a scene from The Sorrows of Satan 1926 and that was based on a, a, sorry, a book of the same title which was released in 1895 by Marie um, Corelli yeah so Again, it just goes to show you that it, even back in the, the post-punk days, yeah. it ties back. Absolutely. It's not going Absolutely. anywhere. It's not going anywhere. I have noticed that in the 2010s, it has decreased a bit. I mean, when you look at bands like Merciful Nuns, Lebanon Hanover, uh, She Passed Away, Twin Tribes, Hat Packs, etc. I've noticed it's not quite there as much as it used to be, mm-hmm. but it's... But it's still relevant to the subculture. I mean, like I said, even the Kentucky Vampires, I mean, they're a very new band and they've got um, Mark of the Vampire in one of their videos. Right. It's not Um, going anywhere. No, sorry, go ahead with your list. Yeah, absolutely. So um, The Cure's song, Just Like Heaven, was Mm -hmm. inspired by Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, I never knew that. And now you know. (laughs) I do. And and I love that song very much. It's wonderful poem it's it's great um there are two bands that are inspired by the title of the fall of the house of usher by edgar Allan poe one of them is called um the house of usher and the other one is called usher house 
Mm-hmm. So there you have two bands that are named after the same story, but Edgar Allan Poe, that's not exactly an accident. Yes, um, I think they're both fairly new. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So How would you describe them? Are they more dark wave, gothic rock, ethereal? I would say they're more gothic rock. Uh, that would make sense. And I, I really, like really like them. Side. Yeah. I should listen to them. You should. You definitely yeah. should. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see here. So we, uh, you did mention Diva Destruction by or uh, Wuthering Heights by, um, he, yeah, yeah. So yeah, inspired by Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights. Um, one of my favorites. <laughs> so there is a song by The Cure called "How Beautiful You Are," and that one is inspired by the poem "Les Yeux de la Pauvre" or "The Eyes of the Poor" by Charles Baudelaire. Okay. What, that one sounds really familiar. I believe I've heard it. Which album is it on? If you know, um, it came out in 1987. I unfortunately did not write down the album. Okay, so it's before disintegration. I can look <sighs> it up later. That's fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then um, let me see here. Um, there's also in the same uh, vein of Charles Baudelaire, there is a band uh, called Les Fleurs du Mal which obviously is inspired by Charles Baudelaire's uh, book yeah. of poetry of the same name. And yeah. again, along that same vein, uh, yeah. there is yet another band inspired by um, Charles Baudelaire, and it is called The Death of Lovers. Mm-hmm. And that is from one of his poems of the very same name. Again, not an accident. It happens. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's called so I, inspiration. <laughs> so I don't understand how these people can look me in the face and be like... <laughs> Literature has nothing to do with goth. And I'm just like, get over yourself, bro. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I think? I think they're kind of coming from the same kind of ego about, um, you know, those who want to call themselves goth but don't like the music. They want a shortcut into the scene. And I don't understand why. I mean, for example, if someone says to me, you're not goth, I wouldn't care. I really couldn't care less because... Mm -hmm. Actions speak louder than words. I've mentioned the bands that I love. I've mentioned some of the literature and film that I like to watch. So, you know, this is just fluff in my opinion. To me, it's the music that matters the most. But to those people, they don't want the music. Now they don't want the literature. They don't want the film. Uh, And even the fashion they don't do correctly because, and I wrote um, about this in an article last year. Mm -hmm. I said, how can one, you know, expect these people to look like average goths when there is no form of goth music or even punk music um, of influence over their style. You know, right. there's there's a really harsh saying from the past. It's an old one. I really like saying it because, you know, so I'm a Turk. I can be a bit harsh on people sometimes. <laughs> you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And for those that are too young to know what a sow is, it's a female pig. You can't make a silk purse out of a pig's ear. You know, if you don't have, you know, for example, I don't know, the flour and the butter, well, you can't make the pancake. This is the same thing. Without the silk, you can't make the silk purse. Without goth music, you can't make a a goth person. And And without the literature, that music would not have existed. Yeah. And that's a really awesome way of thinking about it. Yeah, it's a DNA strand. That's how I think of it. I kind of like to think of it as um, kind of like a, like ruins of a castle Mm -hmm. that was long abandoned and kind of forgotten. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever heard of like Thornwood Castle um, that's just outside of Seattle. No, but I'd like to see it. I love castles. So this castle dates back to the 14th century and was once occupied by Richard III. Mm -hmm. And the pieces of this castle were brought from England to um, the outskirts of Seattle to build this castle. So I kind of like to think that goth, like goth music came from the ruins of this old castle and was built into something new. Yeah interesting that's how i I like to think about it yeah i should definitely look up that castle and it's a perfect analogy it really is it's yeah it's all 
connected. So if people want to argue that the literature is not relevant, I think this video alone, along with the compilation that we mentioned, the of Songs of Terror, um, a gothic tribute to um, Edgar Allan Poe. And they made a similar one for Dracula as well, I think in 1997 to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the publication of Dracula. Oh, I think I know that one. Does it have, have uh, Bela Lugosi on the cover that's black? On the uh, I don't think it has Bela Lugosi. I think it has, like, I think it's like a pinkish purple kind of like smoky oh, okay. um, background and like a, a D with like a fancy seal around it. Okay. Interesting. Um, I, can, I can send it to you. Sure. Sure. But but yeah, like it's obvious that the literature has made an impact on the subculture and those who are saying that it hasn't are just like, um, <laughs> it's just like, what? Are you paying attention? Yeah. What? Idiots. I have to call a spade a spade. Idiots. <laughs> idiots, idiots. And if that makes me a narcissist, I really don't care. Again, going back to this planetary aspect about Chiron in Aries opposing uh, Mercury in Libra, it, you know, these are the facts. That's what Libra is all about. It's about the facts. Oddly and, enough, I am a Libra. Oh, beautiful. You know, I thought you were, but, but you know, I think so is your friend, Angela Benedict. I think she's she is. Libra as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the air signs. And I'm a Gemini, so I'm your sister sign. <laughs> and yeah, so it's all about logic. It's all about facts. So that's what it comes down to. And every subculture, I can talk about other genres as well. I can talk about metal. I can talk about industrial. You know, it's all about facts. You know, as my mother likes to say, one plus one equals two. That's all that it's about. So why is it that people like you and myself get called narcissists and um, uh, or that we're gaslighting people? Or that we're elitists or, or that, that we're, we're gatekeepers. Elitists, or gatekeepers. Yes, that's a very common one now. I don't understand. It's beyond me. You know, it's I try not to entertain it because it's disgusting. It's rancid. Yeah, it's annoying. But unfortunately, especially on social media, we're always bombarded with it. And in fact, I swear, Adrian, I would not be surprised if we have people like that coming into the comments of your video. And <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, dear. <laughs> and on top of that, it's kind of the same thing I deal with occasionally with like... Um, me trying to disprove the uh, misconceptions about absinthe, people actually get really pissed off about me, you know, drawing the connections, telling the truth, busting the misconceptions. And they're just like, um, oh, you're taking the fun out of it. Oh, you're gatekeeping. Oh, you're being an elitist. And I'm just like, no, dude, I'm just telling the truth. It's pure insecurity. That's what it is. And even in that realm, there seems to be some elitism. You talked about it. Some people believe that if it doesn't contain the wormwood, then it's not absinthe at all or something so like that. in that case it is technically true but um people are claiming that the stuff that is available in the u.s still does not contain wormwood even though that's not true um basically the content of the wormwood in absinthe that is allowed to come to the u.s has to be below a thujone content of 10 parts per million or less, mm -hmm. which is about the same level of thujone that was there in the pre-ban yep. era. So people need to get over themselves and learn their facts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Learn the facts. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and do the research. Also, yeah, exactly. Do that. And if you don't mind, I want to scold those people one more time. It's have respect for people who know what they're talking about. There's one person especially that I want to talk about. I love this person very, very, very much. I'm sure you know of her. Her name is Michelle. Her channel's called Skull Girdle. Yes, I, I love her. Yeah, me too. She's an elder goth from the 80s, so she's seen a lot of it happen. And Oh my God, one of the reasons that she doesn't upload as many videos as she used to is because of twits like that. You know, they go on her live stream, they go into her comments, and oh my God, I'm embarrassed to even think about reciting the names that this woman has been called. 
Uh, it's not just elitist. That's over the tip of the iceberg. I'm talking dirty, nasty swear words. And Ugh. you know how old she is. She's old enough to be an older sister to you and I. And for some people, she's old enough to be their mother, if not their aunt. So mm-hmm. is and she's an elder goth. You know, she's been there since she's the been 80s. there. She she's done that. You know, she has the yes. seniority and Absolutely. a little bit of authority, in my opinion. I agree. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons I love her channel very, very much. And oh, my God, when I, you know, remember those comments and the attitude and misbehavior of those people. Oh, my God, goodness. It's, you know, how do you claim that you're golf and you want to be part of the scene and you give yourself the full authority and audacity to claim that? But that's how you disrespect somebody who's been in the scene for over three decades. I'm 29 years old. I was born in 1992. She's been in the scene before that. And the scene goes back to the 70s. So, yeah, you know, they need to um, have some respect. They need self-respect and respect for others, especially those who know what they're talking about and are, you know... Um, happy to share that knowledge. I'm going to quote ATAC, um, you know, Elite Elite Joe. Joe. Oh my God, I, I, I love him. I do too. He's amazing. And he says that when people are doing what you and I are doing right now, we're giving you the key. That's his exact wording. We're giving you the key. We're showing you where it is and we want you to enjoy it because that's how the scene grows. But dismissing us, shutting us out and calling us uh, elitist gatekeepers, narcissists, and low class words does not help you. <clears throat> you know it, that, that's my message mm-hmm. to those people. And I want—I did not want to bring any attention to this, but I think I should. And sorry about the squeaky chair; it needs to be replaced. That's okay. <laughs> um, there, I was involved in an app not very long ago, and like I said, because I like different genres, been involved in different scenes. So this was an app that was um, um, what's that word? congregated of uh, metal hits, whatever you want to word it. Okay. And so it was, it was a chat app, it's called Discord. Now, I'm not going to name this person, not out of respect or anything like that, because as far as I'm concerned, this person is not worthy of my respect. I'm going to keep the, their identity anonymous because I don't want to cause problems. That's just all it is. That's fair. Drama, especially with a scum uh, scene like that, a very awful, problematic scene Mm-mm. like that. So I was on this app and I was talking about um, a CD that I had bought. And it wasn't a goth one, it was a metal one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was talking about how happy I was to have the CD because I like it. And this man commented and he said with an exclamation mark at the end, I love gothic rock. I love gothic rock. Emphasis on the love part. And I said to him, and I've got the screenshot still. I (laughs) said, you know, and I said to him, uh, well, you've piqued my interest. What gothic rock bands do you like? And he named three bands. One of them was Dread Majesty, and the other two were bands I hadn't heard of, but I went to listen to them, and they happened to be metal bands. Oh, dear. So, so I corrected him, and I said, those two bands are metal. They don't count. Uh, Dread Majesty are... Most people, I find, argue they're goth adjacent, which I agree with. Um, but if you consider them golf, that's fine. I put them in the golf section, my iTunes. They're, they go between dark wave, synth, and a bit of new wave. They're kind mm-hmm. of... Um, a cocktail or what's that word amalgam of those things right so but not really gothic rock they don't have that sound they're in the wave side of it so golf but not um for lack of a better word the trad golf if you will so <laughs> right I gave many examples i said gothic rock sounds like uh, and i named him a lot of bands that i like angels of liberty age of heaven paralyzed age suspiria uh, meaning, you know, their older stuff, uh, the Sisters of Mercy, the Nosferatu, and um, uh, Rosetta Stone, the Very Thoughts, etc. Um, I think I even named The Awakening. Uh, I know that's band you and I have in common. We love The Awakening. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they're amazing. So I named him those bands. And guess what his answer was? Neat. That was his answer. Neat. So I said to him, I said, go listen to them. You know, you need to learn the sound. And then his reply was, don't talk to me like that. And I said, 
what do you mean don't talk to you like that? I'm educating you. You made a mistake and I corrected. He said, well, I didn't ask to be educated. And I said, what do you mean? It's not about choice. It's about facts. You, know, you said that you love gothic rock, but you couldn't name one gothic rock band. And then after that, he called me an, um, uh, a gay, no, sorry. He said that I'm gaslighting. And I said, how is that gaslighting? Do you even know what that term means? Or where does it come from? That's a video I need to make on Instagram, especially here in North America, Canadian. I would America. love to see that. They're all for using that word. They don't even know what it is or where it comes from or the movie that inspired the term. Right. <laughs> you know, they know nothing about the history of that, you know, psychological or, or psychology uh, term. And they throw it around like it's candy. Like back in the 2000s, when I was growing up, people used to overuse the word schizophrenic. That's the term people yep. overuse. And now gaslighting seems to have replaced that. And then, uh, so I started to ignore him and then he started to act childish. So whenever someone would suggest a band, he would say, is that gothic rock? It so sounds like it. So he's being, I hate to say it, but typical straight boy behavior. I chose to ignore it. Yeah. So, and then after, you know, a few pokes, I said, you know, I'm choosing to ignore you because you're acting so childish. What was his reply? He said, oh, now you're a narcissist. And then he totally removed me from the app. <sighs> so apparently I'm a gaslighter and a narcissist. Fun. Because I said, that's not gothic rock. And apparently you and I are elitists because we say gothic literature is very uh, prominent in the goth scene. And right. according to another group of smart people, well, in, uh, the only way to be goth is to be a trad goth. You only have, you can only listen to five bands and that's it. <laughs> five bands and that's it. And that's it. I mean, what is this world coming to? <laughs> That's what I'd like to know. <laughs> it's laughable. It really is. <laughs> of course. Well, yeah. thank you so much for coming onto my channel and having this little chat with me. It was a little fun. It, it was a lot Actually, of fun. it was very thanks fun. To you. Yes, thanks to you. And once again, congratulations on your wedding. Thank Kate. you so much. I'm so happy for you. Those uh, pictures are so beautiful. The dress is magnificent. Thank I you. I absolutely love looking at them. And I wish you nothing but health happiness abundance longevity and nothing but for the love between the two of you to grow and to just be of course thank you so much and You're most welcome and thank you to everyone uh, watching after I'm done editing this and putting it together. This was a lot of fun. I'm really glad we did this. Um, Me too. Maybe we can have uh, more chats like this in the future. If you guys um, have a particular subject you'd like us to discuss, uh, feel free to leave it in the comments down below. So uh, thank you so much for watching and you guys have a wonderful rest of your day.